Afternoon. Ah, there we are. Good. Uh, so uh, when I got asked to do this session, I thought uh, I've been to about 30 different conferences uh, in about 12 different countries uh, over the last year, and I've gotten so bored of hearing the word AI, I uh, literally almost uh, yawned to myself uh, in this. But I promise I'm trying to make it relevant and interesting uh, as we go through today. Uh, and just to kind of touch on, I think for me, just kind of what we're seeing in the space and what, how I think it's going to impact kind of us uh, as a kind of reward and benefit industry. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. For those people who don't know me, uh, this is my Lonely Hearts ad. Uh, uh, if you want to talk to me about any of the things at the bottom, I guess what gets me out of bed every day is kind of all the stuff about culture, all the stuff about what makes people do what they do, uh, what makes people kind of work in the way that they work. So uh, if you've got uh, any questions relating to that, um, please do uh, get in touch uh, or indeed just come and speak to me afterwards. I'm here all day. Um, but today, I guess what I wanted to focus on was kind of three areas. So the first one was where are we today, really, with AI? What's the kind of promise, uh, and how far along are we in that promise? I think the second one is really then give you some kind of real-life examples. So what's actually starting to happen? What are we starting to see it used for? Where are we starting to kind of see the rubber meet the road, as it were? And then the last bit is really how my thoughts, I guess, and uh, my opinion at the end, just on kind of where I think it might start to have some real implications for us and some real positive impact of what we can do, as I said earlier on in our industry. I have been known to speak very quickly. I have been known to sometimes go off at a tangent. I did fall off stage in one presentation earlier in the year. So keep everything peeled, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll get through it together. Great. Um, I guess um, whether you believe that it's kind of an over- or under-hyped thing, it's no doubt that it's kind of everywhere. Whether you kind of sit on the spectrum of OK, at one end, it's going to help us augment us, help us do better things. Or at the other end, it's going to take over, destroy us, and kill us all. Um, somewhere in between is probably some semblance of the reality of what's going to happen with artificial intelligence. And I think there's no doubt at all, though, that it's quite hyped. Um, there's lots going on about it. But for me, I think there's no doubt that it will have significant implications for all of us in the kind of medium to long-term future. If I kind of just explain a bit more as to why, I don't know if anyone saw these articles, but when you have people like Mr. Putin, a good friend of mine, um, uh, 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 kind of starting to talk about the fact that whoever leads AI will be the next world superpower, uh, that starts to make me slightly nervous. Uh, when you've got people in China saying that we want to be the world leader in AI by 2030, um, that obviously also starts to make me you know, slightly nervous in terms of how and where it might lead us to. I think the interesting thing with the Chinese ambition that's very different than what's happening perhaps in America or in the UK or other fields is China is leading a coordinated effort in terms of its research focus on AI. And it's very different than what's happening in the rest of the world. And I just want to underline, that sounds, I know it sounds like a technical point, but when the government is deciding who's researching what, you can be very, very coordinated about what you do, which means you will probably get to an outcome potentially faster. Anyway, so you've got lots of world leaders talking about it. Um, you've also got lots of people talking about the kind of combined issues. So loads of people talking about kind of artificial intelligence on one side, loads of people talking about kind of well-being on the other. Um, right up, Kim, right through all organizations, certainly that I speak to, to kind of make that material. So this graph here is earnings calls in 2017 that took uh, effectively where people mentioned AI. So uh, hopefully you can see the graph kind of vastly climbing to the right-hand side. Around about 330 different earnings calls uh, last year, people commented on the fact that they were investing in AI, they bought something to do with AI, they were doing something in and around that space. And then on the flip side, lots and lots of organizations having it as kind of the second or third biggest issue that they're focused on culturally around well-being of their people and how they make their people well. So there's no doubt at all in my mind that kind of the two issues are probably going to start to coincide uh, in quite some, uh, not, not necessarily aggressive way, but I think they'll kind of definitely start to come together. When I look at the promise, I guess, as I said earlier on, I've heard lots and lots about artificial intelligence. My true, honest belief is actually the whole word will start to disappear and we will just start to interact and use things that take advantage of, of AI and machine learning and you'll kind of forget all about the fact that it's there and it's in the background. And probably a lot of what you interact with today is already using it in that way. So for anyone who's been on LinkedIn in the last 24 hours, where you see those auto responses that are at the bottom of your messages, they are all driven by machine learning. So they're all driven by the algorithm learning what sort of things you respond to, what you don't respond to, and the sorts of things that you say. But when you look at the promise, I guess there's kind of a certain amount of fear involved in when we think about the words kind of artificial intelligence. And I think that there's this kind of idea of, you know, we're going from this place of kind of narrow AI where it can do very specific tasks, it can help you do very specific things, through to this kind of concept of trying to apply AI to different scenarios and different situations and this idea of general AI. 
And then this idea that something's going to take over and kill us all and dominate the world. Um, so I think we're somewhere between narrow and general, depending on who you talk to. Um, we're definitely more leaning onto the kind of narrow AI side of things. Um, and if I kind of make that real, I guess uh, for anyone who's had to help a computer work out whether it's a muffin or a dog, um, or indeed a towel or a dog, a bagel or a dog, uh, a mop or a dog, um, those sorts of things are where we are helping machines to learn which side of this particular coin an image falls. So is it a towel, is it a dog, uh, or otherwise. I think the interesting thing is when you dig a bit deeper into this, there were some tests that were run at the back end of last year that just kind of looked at how advanced had we gotten in terms of image recognition from machines. And when you look at this, this particular example here is actually us asking machines to identify simple things in pictures that a four-year-old could identify. So it's asking you to look at things like which is the person wearing the kind of which is the man wearing the glasses, which picture has got the umbrella upside down. So it's the sorts of things that four-year-olds could answer. But effectively, the machine singularly failed to answer today. So no doubt that will change and improve over time. But today, I think that we are definitely, definitely in this kind of era of kind of narrow AI doing very specific tasks with a view that it will move towards general AI. To quote Andrew Ng, who's probably one of the most advanced people in this field, he led AI research at Baidu and then um, at um, Google. He very much says, I'm going to worry about super AI as much as I worry about overpopulation on Mars i.e. we've got to get everyone there first. So I think, you know, he's obviously a big proponent. He's invested his whole life in it, so you can kind of take any bias in that. But I think there is a lot to get through and get done that we may never get done to actually end up getting to this kind of end of the world. So if I kind of position it that that's kind of the promise that we see, what's some of the real life stuff that we were doing today? And I had loads of fun researching this presentation because it was literally, I had to cut it down in the end because there was just so many different examples I could have used. I've tried to just focus on some ones that really kind of over the last year or so have made me kind of really think kind of wow in terms of what they're trying to do and what they're trying to get done. I'll share a couple of those with you today. Organization called Freenome. I don't know if anyone's, anyone ever come across this? Nope. Freenome is a startup in the US and basically, I don't know if, if anyone's been related to or themselves has ever been diagnosed with cancer, the, tr the kind of uh, process you have to go through to get diagnosed is typically you have a scan and then you have something pretty invasive. You'll have a biopsy done or something done to your body to try and get a piece of that tissue out there so you can have it, go have it tested. What these guys have managed to do is actually identify that a lot of the DNA markers for cancer are in your blood. So effectively, what they're enabling it to do is at scale, they're now starting to look at every time we take a blood sample, kind of look at those indicators to see are you either do you have cancer or are you more likely to be getting cancer or somewhere on that kind of trajectory and actually start to diagnose that. And the beauty about using machine learning to do it is they're making it cheaper and cheaper every single day, week, month to a point now where they're actually with a high confidence able to start to look at those DNA predictors for a number of cancers. So basically, they're in this place where actually you can actually start to think, every time I go and have my blood taken, they're going to run these screens over the top of that with machines and help me work out, is there something I need to go do? Is there something I should be worried about? And as we all know, early intervention typically creates a better outcome. Not always, but most of the time it does. So just kind of when you start to think about doing that scale, this is where kind of narrow AI really comes in. So it's looking at data, images, and diagnosis information to get you to what actually is a phenomenal outcome for us as individual human beings. Slightly different example. Probably all seen this um, as a result of the kind of Apple uh, update that went out recently. But um, what Cardiogram did that was really clever was actually took a non-medical grade device and using machines looking across vast quantities of data, started to look at, could I tell you if you had a specific issue with your heart as a result of the information that we were gathering from that device? So typically, you think those devices talk to, you know, you kind of monitor exercise and sleep and movement and all those kind of good things. What they were actually able to see with a huge degree of accuracy was other heart conditions that you may have. So did you have some kind of murmur? Did you have some, some kind of fibrillation? Did you have something wrong that they could start to help you again work out early on and effectively treat in a very proactive way. Another couple of different, slightly different examples here. I guess as a benefit industry, we kind of put lots and lots of content in front of our people all the time. There's lots and lots of information for them to wade through. And I think one of the really fascinating things is there's lots of AI startups in this space of simplification of data and information from an employee perspective. So actually, if I can take a huge policy documentation and make it make sense to people, enable them to ask me questions about it that are very human, will that be a better experience overall for an individual than not? And I personally think it will be, and I think that's a huge, huge field uh, more generally. 
Um, slightly different tone and tack. You got the smart replies. Anyone use smart reply? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, smart reply is built into Google. Originally, it was a bit of an April Fool's Day joke that they did, uh, and then they launched a formal product back in 2015. If you think of the size and scale of Gmail and how many people are sending messages, smart reply is effectively automated replies, and it's now over. It's nearly over 15% actually of all replies that go out from Google every single day are actually their smart replies. So it is a machine creating a response and a reply on your behalf that you then say yes or no to, or it might give you optionality to do that. So if you think about that as scale, about how machines can get access to information or start to help you, um, it just starts to become a really, really huge opportunity, I think. Um, uh, certainly uh, something that's close to my heart in terms of uh, how suicide's impacted my life, there's some fantastic things that we're starting to see in this field as well of people analysing electronic health records and starting to be able to find markers and indicators of where someone may be more susceptible to you know, have a mental health issue or have a problem or have something that may cause them to want to commit suicide and then enable us to intervene early on. There's also some fantastic research that's been done with kind of counselling helplines. So if you were to text the Samaritans or if you were to kind of get involved with any of those organisations who are seeking to provide you help in those moments that are important to you, you can actually start to see how machine learning will enable you to properly put the right information in front of that person, work out how they are in terms of dangers to themselves or not, and then what you can do subsequently as a result of that. And I think we'll see some massive advances in how we can help people deal with mental health issues and challenges, deal with some of the problems that they may be suffering from, and do it in a way that perhaps removes some of the stigma. Because to be honest, a bot isn't going to judge who you are. It's got no stigma attached to it. It's got, it's some, in some instances, it only knows some core information about you. Uh, and so actually, it's kind of a very constructive way to enable you to deal with anxiety or otherwise. So I guess that's just some practical examples. There was genuinely tons, but <laughs> so they went all a bit weird and wonderful at one point. So uh, when I was reviewing it, I always do that thing where I sit and review it with my daughter. And as a 12-year-old critic, she can be pretty harsh. So I think um, uh, she did say uh, I was going a little bit off, off tack. So uh, we took a few things out. But hopefully, I guess you get a sense of the sorts of areas it's helping us and the sorts of areas that we're kind of going to see start to come to fruition over the kind of next uh, five, six, seven years. So I guess how does that actually make any relevance to kind of employee well-being? How do we kind of see that come together? I think it's going to be incremental. There was obviously some massive kind of health-related pieces in that that I'm kind of not going to dig into any more detail today. But I think for me, there's a kind of piece around how overwhelmed people are today. When I kind of look at most employees, they are pretty kind of it's information coming at all of us every single day, right? So the beauty about a mobile device is it connects you to everything, you know, whether it's family, friends, work. Uh, the downside of that is it connects you to everyone and everything um, all the time. So it's kind of, it's really a case of, I think all of us probably have those moments where we feel completely overwhelmed by everything that's going on uh, and everything that's going on within the workplace uh, and certainly everything that might be going on in your own life as well. But around that, if you think about in kind of the kind of reward and benefit space where we sit today, I guess when you think about all of the variety of things that we offer employees, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, I think that despite our best attempts to try and create great experiences around what we're delivering to people and trying to put great things in front of people that we might want them to be involved with or take or that are culturally aligned or that are about looking after them and helping them look after themselves and look after, as the speaker said earlier on, the kind of planet, it, it's still very hard. It feels very hard to be an employee often and kind of connect some of these things together. You know, we're left with people asking kind of, you know, what is the policy? How does it work? Who do I go to? Who can help me? And when you're left with these kind of simplistic questions, I think you have to start to question what is it that we're doing wrong today that we could improve potentially with some of this new technology. I'll expand on that just for a second. So when you think about kind of um, an experience around any piece of technology, I think the fascinating thing for me is that when we get stuck, and I'm sure we've all gotten stuck, I've definitely gotten stuck trying to do things before, typically we'll try and find our way through it a little bit, and then we'll try and look for some help, right? So if I call someone or contact them, what typically happens is the first person I speak to is challenging me from a, uh, from a perspective of who am I, right? Prove who you are. Right, okay, I'm going to prove who I am. Second time, they, they can't help because it's more complex, so they're going to pass me to someone else. So I've got to prove who I am again. And then I have to also explain what my issue is, hopefully in a way they understand. And so you end up with this kind of backwards and forwards where I'm trying to get help, but actually it's just not really helping. It's not contextually helping. It's not doing anything for me. 
And so actually what we have a real opportunity to do, I think, with the whole piece around kind of uh, AI and these automated responses, is contextually help people better. So wherever I am, wherever I'm stuck, whatever I'm doing, I can understand everything I know about you today. I might not know everything, but I know what I know. So why do I make you prove who you are again? Why do I make you explain what page you're stuck on? Why do I make you explain what benefit you're stuck on? When actually, right here and in the page, I can do all of that because I know and understand you and where you are today. And we can start to really do that at scale. If I give you an example, um, so let's just say this individual here has been diagnosed with cancer, okay? So I'm being a bit morbid today, sorry about that, all cancer and suicide, so we'll, we'll, we'll get some good stuff in the end. Um, so let's say they've been diagnosed with cancer. More often than not, what happens is we've got all of these great things that we've put in place to try and make that person's life better in that situation, to try and protect them, to try and do a whole set of stuff to help them get well. But what happens is typically you start on a path, so let's say I go to the medical insurance provider, and I start on a pathway that sort of forgets everything else. And then they don't really talk. They don't really connect. They don't really come back together at any point. So I don't really know, unless I stumble upon it. Sorry about the Simpsons references. Um, if I stumble upon it, um, I don't really know that the EAP might be there, that it can help me. I don't really know that me or my partner potentially could get counselling to help me through what, in essence, is quite a traumatic event that I'm going through today. So actually, what we can start to do is properly bring together and connect a whole set of things to create a better experience for someone that if they are you know, diagnosed with this or if they're having and struggling with their financial well-being or whatever it might be, that actually they can end up in this place where they can go and get real information that's contextually relevant in a very, very quick fashion or indeed speak to someone, but that that person understands where are they at, what are they doing, why are they stuck, how can I help you, what's the outcome you're trying to get to. Does that make sense? So I think there's a real opportunity to us as stage one of this kind of idea of how can we leverage machines is to actually start to think about how you can actually make some of these journeys simpler for people, how you can connect all the pieces together that they might not be thinking about themselves, but that you can do in a very, very scalable and automated and personalized way as part of that. I want to make sure we have some time for questions. So I guess in context, I think that there's no doubt at all from my perspective that in the kind of long term, we need to make sure we tread carefully when it comes to artificial intelligence, what we do and what we build and what we're capable of doing. But in the short to medium term, I think we're going to see these huge leaps and these huge evolutions that come that really, really help us, that help us diagnose things better, that help us intervene better, that help us understand people better, and that really help us to try and make life that little bit easier, that little bit simpler, and just really, really kind of do it in a way that's very intuitive, that kind of meets people where they want to interact, and that enables us to kind of really do that, as I said, at scale. Uh, I'm here all day. If you want to reach out to me at any of these particular addresses, I would love to hear from you. I love people who completely disagree with me. So if any of you completely think I've, I'm barking mad, I'd love to hear that as well. Um, they're often the best conversations.